To answer this question, I am privileged to have Dr. Russell Humphreys join us on the phone today. Dr. Humphreys received a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and a PhD in Physics specializing in cosmic rays and ultra-high energy nucleon-nucleon interactions. It's interesting that he committed his life to Christ and became a young Earth creationist during his years at school. Dr. Humphreys worked at Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico from 1979 until 2001 when he retired to work full-time for the Institute for Creation Research as a professor of physics. He resigned from ICR in 2008 and now works as an independent researcher. Now, this has been a long time coming. I've had so many people specifically request if I could get you on the show. So it's great to have you on. Thanks for joining me, Dr. Humphreys, and welcome to the show. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to be on your show. I get a huge kick out of it every time I watch it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. So the first question that's on everyone's mind, a question I get asked so often, is that of distant starlight. Now, you, of course, are familiar with it. The question goes, uh, we have stars that are a billion light years away, so it takes the light billions of years to get here. So how can light from a star even one billion light years away get here on Earth if the universe is only 6,000 years old? And I'm sure you would agree it's actually an excellent question. Now, having been a skeptic for so many years, I've gotten in the habit of, of looking past the question or problem and probing to some of the more unseen questions or assumptions behind it. And my first question is, are those stars really that far away? How do we know they are so far away? Yeah, I get asked that question a lot. Uh uh, I always wonder what's behind the question. Are uh, the creationists who ask that question, are they saying uh, maybe the stars are no more than 6,000 light years away from us? All the stars that we can observe uh, are that close to us, and then we uh, would have no problem getting the starlight to uh, us on Earth uh, within 6,000 years. Is, is that kind of the, uh, what's behind that question, you think? It's, it's just a question partly for myself. It's more just out of curiosity. How do you know that the star, stars are so far away? And I know that some of the viewers would have that same question as well. Okay. Uh, well, I think a lot of people who are asking it want to say maybe the stars are uh, only 6,000 light years away. And so if you take all the stars that the Hubble telescope can see, which is about 10 billion trillion, uh, and stuff them into a sphere that has a radius of 6,000 light years, you get about six stars right in our own solar system. So we, uh, we would, I would think we would have noticed. So uh, now if, uh, if they're further away than that, uh, then the creationist, uh, young Earth creationist, still has a problem. Uh, so uh, so uh, the distance thing won't solve any problems. That's what I'm saying. But how we know, uh, there's about a dozen different methods that astronomers use, and they overlap, and they dovetail, and they agree with each other pretty well. And uh, one of the most famous ones is uh, Edwin Hubble back in the 1930 uh, used uh, Cepheid variables or Cepheid variables or Cepheid variables. I hope the astronomers will forgive me for mangling the pronunciation of that. Uh, uh, those are stars uh, that we can observe in our own galaxy nearby. And uh, we can measure the distances of those stars uh, just by triangulating uh, on them from, uh, as the Earth moves around in its orbit. Uh, so we know the distance of those stars, and uh, they vary their light output from day to day or week to week, depending on how big the star is. And, uh, and uh, you can make a connection between how bright the star is and, and its period, whether it's days or a few weeks. So, uh, uh, so they serve as sort of a standard candle uh, that uh, Hubble used to look at the uh, Andromeda galaxy. And he found some bright stars uh, that varied from uh, day to day and week to week. Uh, 
And uh, so he just, with his photographic plates, identified three or four of those Cepheid variables. Cepheid, Cepheid variables. <laughs> Do you know how to pronounce that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's Cepheid. Cepheid. Okay. Um, anyhow, uh, he could then he knew how bright uh, they were from nearby, so he could tell how bright they were in Andromeda ca- Galaxy, and then uh, just determine. Uh, the intensity of the light from them that's reaching Earth and use the one over distance squared uh, law to determine how far away the galaxy was. And uh, that was the first determination of how far away uh, some of the nearby galaxies were. They didn't know uh, whether they were outside of our own galaxy and just small clouds of of gas or uh, they were really far away. So Cepheid variables is a a Cepheid variables and uh, Another one uh, is uh, type 1A supernova, a particular uh, type of supernova with a certain type of spectrum. Uh, And again, they know um, how bright they are when they go off uh, in our own galaxy. Uh, And they can detect these up to 60 million light years away pretty easily now. And uh, and so they can again uh, tell the brightness uh, by knowing what type of supernova it is. They know its brightness so it's putting out so many watts uh, at its peak brightness of the explosion, and uh, they can use the one over distance law again just to, to tell the distance. So those uh, those distances uh, are really big out there, and uh, uh, you know that's not the solution to the creationist problem of how to get the distant starlight to us. Excellent. Okay. So, and so it is a legitimate question then. How do these light from distant stars get to us then? Uh, so, do these distant stars not also pose problems uh, even for those who believe the universe is billions of years old? Well, uh, they have a bit of a problem uh, if they believe in the Big Bang Theory because um, different parts of the universe uh, appear to be at the same temperature. Uh, in particular, the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation, and uh, and it's it's hard uh, within uh, you know for uh, one side of the universe to be at exactly the same temperature as the opposite side of the universe hmm. uh, if they're billions of light years away, which they are, and uh, and yet uh, the speed of light is limited, so they have a bit of a problem with that. Okay. Now, uh, creationists have set out to answer this question of distant starlight in a number of ways. One of them is that perhaps God created not just the star, but also the light itself in transit. So in other words, uh, God didn't just create the star, but also created, say, a whole string of light photons between the star and Earth. What what do you think of that theory? Well, uh First, uh, we need to know that there are events that we see out there in the cosmos. We see exploding stars and supernovas and other things that happen suddenly and, uh, and drastically. And uh, uh, the light created in transit theory would require a false history of those events, um, particular like a, an exploding star. We see an exploding star 100,000 light years away from us. And, uh, and uh, uh, the light created in transit theory says that about 6,000 light years away from us, 6,000 years ago, God created uh, the images of an exploding star. And those images then came in towards us and arrived uh, recently. Uh, now, uh, the theory would say then that the actual star didn't explode either then or ever. Uh, so there would be no explosion. So we would be seeing um, a picture of an event that never happened. And so we would have a, a false history in the sky. And uh, that deeply bothers me uh, because it says uh, in Psalm 19, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Now if the heavens are declaring things that didn't happen, what does that say about God's glory? I think, uh, I think it's a bad thing to say, but I know some very fine creationists who aren't at all bothered by that. 
uh, and they say it's fine with them if uh, if God creates a false history. So it's a philosophical question, uh, more or less. Uh, but um, a lot of uh, creationists I knew back in the 80s, uh, mid 80s, weren't very happy with that uh, thing. So that set me on the trail of looking for a better answer. Now. Uh, Another problem with the theory is that it doesn't explain other things that we see, major features of the cosmos, such as the increase of redshift of light from distant galaxies as uh, they get further and further away from us, or uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, why it's so uniform and what causes it. And then the third thing, there's no uh, real scripture uh, that says that particular thing happened. Uh, we don't know, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, no advocate of the light created in transit theory can say, now here's a scripture that says that's what God did. Uh, he can't do that. Uh, so there's just no uh, scriptural basis for it either. So uh, that's, what, uh, that's the problem with that theory. But I do want to emphasize that if a person is happy with that theory, uh, uh, they can just stop, uh, uh, not uh, investigate my theory or any of the other creationist theories uh, on cosmos, uh, but just, uh, you know, be happy. <laughs> That's fine. An excellent response. I like that. Now, what about the possibility that perhaps the speed of light has changed over time? Uh, in other words, the speed of light was uh, many magnitudes faster in the past than it is now. Thus, the light actually got here really, really fast in the past, and now the speed of light has slowed down dramatically. And so a light year would have been far shorter in the past than now. How, how do you respond to that proposition? Well, first I'd say uh, probably by that, what you're getting at, a uh, light year would have been lo far longer. It's a distance, uh, and you're saying that a light year would be a great distance rather than... Uh, oh, yes. Know, Yes, I said that backwards. You're correct, yes. So, uh, now, first, uh, there's no data showing it. Uh, the Barry Setterfield, who introduced that theory back in the mid-'80s, thought he had some uh, uh, several-century-year-old data that pointed to a, a decrease uh, in the speed of light still going on. But uh, as uh, the physical scientists in the creationist movement started looking <clears throat> at the data, uh, it evaporated uh, when you actually analyze the data properly. Um, uh, there's no trend between three, 300 years ago and now. Uh, it's flat, no change. So no data. Uh, now the second is uh, a, something that might be a little hard to understand. Uh, the speed of light looks like it affects the rates of all physical processes, including gravity, and including uh, uh, radioactive uh, radioactivity uh, and atomic clocks <clears throat> and watches and how fast you digest your meal uh, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so the speed of light affects this, uh, the rates of all physical processes. If you speed up light's speed, then those physical processes will speed up with it and lockstep is as far as I can tell from all the physics data that I know, that's what would happen. So, so if you speed up light and you uh, speed up, say, the, the, the rotation of the Earth around the sun one year, <clears throat> you would have a shorter year and you would have faster light, but the product of how far light would go in one year would remain the same distance same number of kilometers right you with me if, on that if you drive faster but at the same time your clock ticks faster then your speed stays the same i, I follow you there in other words uh if the speed of light changes everything changes and as far as we can tell um, we can't detect the change our clocks uh change right along with uh the speed of light and we can't measure a change in it so, uh, so that was a serious problem. I raised it to Barry Setterfield, and he came back with a, a theory that said, well, maybe some clocks don't get changed and others do, but he never really managed to make that theory work. So, uh, so 
the, there's this theoretical problem as well as the experimental problem. Okay, very interesting. Now, speaking of interesting, you have built a fascinating model which would appear to answer the question of distant starlight. I know this is really complicated, but I know you're also really good at explaining complicated subjects, so let's give it a shot. What's the, what's the foundation of your model, if we could perhaps start there? Well, if you remember back in Genesis chapter 1, uh, God created an expanse in the middle of some waters. Uh, and uh, the waters under that expanse later became the earth, and the expanse looks like it expanded billions of light years uh, to be able to include all the stars and galaxies we now see. And then there were waters above that expanse. That biblical picture of things uh, says then that the Earth is, you know, roughly near the center, at least on a cosmic scale of distances. The the Earth is roughly at the center of the universe, and that makes for some uh, interesting situations regarding gravity and time. The bottom line of my theory is, in fact, I've got two theories, and both of them say this that there would be a situation regarding gravity uh, at the beginning of the world on the fourth day of creation as measured with ordinary clocks here, an ordinary day, uh, there would be a, a way that uh, events way out in the universe could be going on very fast compared to our clocks here. And uh, basically this is something called gravitational time dilation and it doesn't depend on the force of gravity or weight, it depends on the energy uh, of gravity. It takes a certain amount of energy to lift an object from Earth all the way to the far reaches of the universe uh, and out beyond the farthest star. And uh, the Big Bang Theory doesn't suffer from, uh, I shouldn't say, doesn't have this advantage. <laughs> Uh, the Big Bang Theory says that there is no empty space way out there, and there is no center, that all places are pretty much the same, uh, and uh, there is no unique center. And uh, so the Big Bang Theory does not have gravitational time dilation, and, but a Bible-based uh, Bible universe that does have a center has a center of gravity, and uh, near the center of gravity uh, at a certain time, time would be very much slower, time would tick slower on Earth than it would way out in the distant universe. So this gives a way for light to get to us in a hurry as measured by our clocks. And our clocks are the ones that matter because those are the ones that God set up uh, in Genesis 1 to mark off time, days and years and signs and seasons rotation of the earth day and night uh, and so on uh, so uh, uh, as measured by clocks on earth the universe would be very young 6,000 years uh, but as measured by clocks way out there uh, you could get billions of years and if you were way out there and you look back uh, could see what was happening on earth uh, on the fourth day of creation it would look like things were dead stopped no rotation, no orbiting. If you had been on Earth during that time and could have seen what was going on way out in the universe, it would look like uh, a video in Fast Forward uh, with things happening very fast. And if you could see it, the light zooming in towards us at faster than 186,000 miles per second as measured by clocks right here on Earth. So it would be an ordinary day uh, as far as anyone could tell, uh, you would eat uh, three meals and feel like sleeping, uh, but it would be uh, a day in which an extraordinary thing would happen, and that is the light from distant galaxies would arrive on Earth. Very interesting. So there's an unexpected variable there which many people wouldn't grasp right away, which, ironically, I just touched on, uh, touched on this subject in the Christmas special, actually, and that variable is time. We tend not to think of time as a variable, at least I tried to argue that time was a variable with my boss when I was late getting to work and delayed the train, but he didn't buy that argument. argument. <laughs> uh, but time itself is a variable in all of this equation. 
So um, how does that play into all of your model then? Well, it's the essence of my model. Uh, I'm saying that clocks don't tick at the same rate in different places at, uh, uh, at different times. Uh, that uh, clocks do not tick at the same rate in different places uh, in general. And that's an experimentally observed fact. Uh, you know, people have this image in their head of clocks of time ticking at the same rate uh, throughout the universe in all the clocks are nicely synchronized and everything uh, uh, ticks at the same rate. Uh, but, uh, but the actual facts of physics don't allow that. Uh, we can measure uh, differences in clock rates uh, with differences in altitude uh, with atomic clocks. And uh, under some situations, when you're considering something the size of the universe, uh, you can get uh, drastic differences in clock rates. So, uh, so uh, it's a hard thing for people to get their heads around. Uh, but the hard thing is simply their preconception that time is some something immutable, that, uh, that it's beyond creation, that it's something almost sacred uh, uh, and ticks in unison throughout the universe. Uh, but the true fact is that time is a part of our created universe. Uh, it's just another part of God's creation. It started with the beginning. And uh, so uh, the time that we are enmeshed in, anyhow, let's say, there may be time outside of our created universe, uh, probably is, but uh, the time that we're enmeshed in is just another created servant of God, and he's able to, uh, to have his servant behave just the way he wants to get things done. So I think he used uh, uh, time and relativity effects upon time um, as a way that we could see a really big universe in a very short time. That, that is really just a philosophical assumption for the Big Bang Theory, that there is no center, no edge, no empty space. Is that correct? That's right. And so, basically, if there is a center and an edge, and if there is areas where there is more gravity, basically where there is more gravity in the universe, time slows down uh, is the essence of your model. Yes. Uh, two things to point out that people get tripped uh, up over. One is that... Uh, when we say an edge, uh, what I'm meaning is simply a place where there are no more stars, where, where you reach the last star as you move up uh, the last galaxy, and beyond that there was just some empty space of the same sort that uh, we travel through. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's what I mean by an edge, an edge to matter. And the second thing is uh, uh, the word gravity to people usually means weight gravitational force. So, uh, so my theory gets distorted uh, when it's reported uh, to, to critics uh, and, uh, and, and so they say, uh, well, uh, if it takes huge gravity to slow down clocks on Earth, then everything would weigh uh, trillions of tons and nobody would survive that. Uh, so, but it's not really gravitational force, not weight but it's gravitational energy. And uh, physicists have a name for the particular kind of energy. They call it potential energy. And uh, that's the important thing in the time dilation equations, is this energy. Energy is not force. Energy is not weight. Uh, so uh, uh, there are no uh, enormous elephants sitting upon Adam's chest uh, as he views uh, <laughs> the time-dilated universe. So now, another area which I've mentioned quite often on the show here is your theoretical work on planetary magnetic fields. You proposed a theory for the origin of the magnetic fields of planets, like Earth. Uh, everybody knows Earth has a magnetic field. That's how your compasses point north and south, or your iPhone nowadays. Uh, <laughs> but you proposed a model for why Earth and other planets, and even moons, would have a magnetic field. Why, why don't you tell us about that? Okay, it's based on uh, the thing that set me off on this was I found uh, that the Greek of Second Peter 3.5 uh, says something that isn't in uh, some of our translations and is in other uh, translations. 
but it says uh, essentially in Greek, uh, the earth was formed out of water and by means of water. And so I said, wow, that sounds like he made the earth all water and then transformed the water, obviously, to other stuff after that. And then going back uh, to Genesis chapter 1 and looking at the second verse, uh, darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. So it sounds like God made a lot of water first, um, and, uh, and including making the earth uh, of water uh, down at the center of that body of large water called the deep. Uh, so, if he made it of water, then those would be ordinary water molecules, I would think. And, uh, and uh, there's a way, it hit me, uh, that God could make uh, the right amount of magnetic field to explain the Earth's present magnetic field if, when he formed the water, if he made the water, created the water out of nothing, uh, if he just created the hydrogen nuclei in the, each molecule, uh, those are little spinning balls of charge, little spinning protons, and because they spin, they have a magnetic field. And if he made all the spins of the, the many uh, hydrogen nuclei and all those water molecules, if they all pointed in the same direction, you get a field that's uh, you know, roughly 10 times stronger than our present field. Then uh, probably he converted uh, the water to other stuff right away and the spins went away. But once you've started a magnetic field, a uh, magnetic field tends to maintain itself. Uh, if there's anything even slightly electrically conducting around, the magnetic field will maintain itself by starting up an electric current in uh, what will become the Earth's core. And uh, so uh, right now that current is about 6 billion amperes and it circulates westward and it's what maintains uh, the Earth's magnetic field. And, uh, but it's a decaying magnetic field and if you extrapolate that decay backwards uh, 6,000 years you get uh, a field that's as strong as my lined up protons in the, in the water would give you. Hmm. And so I said, wow, that's really neat. Uh, usually when uh, physicists get crazy ideas like that, uh, there are many orders of magnitude off. And you know, so we, have, we fill our wastebaskets with uh, uh, crazy ideas that don't work. Uh, so uh, this, I said, wow. Uh, so I published that in 1983 in the Creation Research Society Quarterly, a little article called The Creation of the Earth's Magnetic Field. And then that year I decided, well, it worked so well for the Earth, what about the other bodies in the solar system? The sun, the moon, uh, the planets, and so forth. Um, uh, some of those magnetic fields uh, had been measured by that time for the sun. Uh, and by that time, the moon's former magnetic field had been measured. It, it once had a strong magnetic field, according to the moon rocks the astronauts brought back. Uh, and, you know, some of the planets had been measured, but not all of them. So uh, for the ones that have been measured, the theory fit very well. All, all you need to know uh, is the mass of, the, of each planet, and that tells you how much water there might have been at the very beginning. Uh, and uh, gives you the strength of the field. And then if you know something about the, the planet's uh, conducting core, uh, you can tell how fast electrical resistance will wear down the electrical current uh, and make the field decay away. The bigger the core, the less fast it, it uh, dies away. And there, there were estimates for these. So uh, uh, it fit very well for uh, all the planets and bodies uh, in the solar system that had been measured by spacecraft up to that time or by astronomical means. And uh, so, uh, but we didn't know the strength of the field for the planets Uranus and Neptune. And uh, Voyager 2 was scheduled to go by uh, that a few years after I published uh, my article, Creation of Planetary Magnetic Fields, mm. 
in the December 1984 Creation Research Society Quarterly. So uh, I would uh, I I published a few predictions about what space probes would find in the future. And uh, predictions are the most powerful method of affirming or refuting a theory. Uh, it's it's easy for a theorist after the fact, after a measurement's been made, to adjust knobs and bells and whistles on his theory uh, so it fits a fact. Uh, <laughs> it's harder to do that when you have a whole bunch of facts to fit, but nonetheless, if you go out on a limb and you say, well, uh, here's what my theory says we should find, uh, you know, I can't, I can't uh, adjust uh, my prediction after it's been made and in print, and so it's a way of keeping the theorist honest. Uh, you know, he, he just says, uh, this will either confirm my theory or break it, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm sure that must have been nerve-wracking to put your predictions in print back when the technology didn't even yet exist to verify some of your predictions. So have any of your predictions been proven or falsified yet? Yeah, uh, it really wasn't nerve-wracking. I, I have this loose attitude toward my theories. Uh, um, you know, I admit the fact that I'm not God and I'm not writing scripture and I, my theory oh, might, be, okay. uh, might be wrong, you know, uh, and it, it will be no great disaster if my theory is wrong, okay? So actually, uh, I just said, uh, here's a way you can, uh, we'll both find out, you, the reader, and me, whether my theory uh, sounds like it's right. And so I did, I went out and uh, I made some predictions. Uh, were you asking what the predictions were? Uh, y yes. Have any of your predictions been proven or falsified yet? Yes. Uh, all five predictions I made in the, that article, uh, the, the important ones, uh, there's a sixth one that, uh, about Pluto that hasn't been checked yet, but it doesn't, not really a very dramatic uh, prediction. Uh, it agrees with the evolutionary, because Pluto probably is made of ice and has no magnetic field uh, left. Uh, it doesn't have a good enough conducting core. But the other six predictions I uh, made have all come true, uh, all been verified by spacecraft. And yet so, those who believe in deep time and believe that our solar system is billions of years old are completely baffled by all of these points. In other words, uh, did not these facts completely contradict all of their predictions? Yeah, now uh, some of their, I wouldn't say all of their predictions, I'll give you an example. Uh, the planet Uranus uh, has no measurable heat flow according to uh, infrared observations through telescopes. Uh, so they thought that the planet Uranus could not have uh, what they call a magnetic dynamo uh, generating its ma any magnetic field. So they thought that when Voyager went by Uranus, it would detect very little field, if any. Uh, but my theory was saying, no, Uranus should have uh, a pretty strong field, uh, you know, comparable to the strength of the Earth's field uh, for that size planet. And so, uh, uh, well, uh, the Voyager flew by Uranus, and my prediction was verified, and theirs wasn't. So then they updated their prediction for Neptune. Uh, they, uh, they said, well, Neptune's a sister planet, sort of, to Uranus, and so it should have the same sort of magnetic field, so uh, we're going to say that Neptune should also have a strong magnetic field, and then uh, they moved it up uh, to a range that pretty well uh, was the same as my prediction already. So uh, their, their predictions are sort of hand-waving. Uh, they can't get quantitative with uh, their dynamo theories, even after nearly a century of developing them. So all they can do is sort of scale uh, between planets, like we did uh, here for Uranus and Neptune. Uh, so, but they've had uh, they had uh, some pretty remarkable failures uh, with uh, the Mercury, uh, uh, with Mars, and uh, they can't understand why the Moon had a strong magnetic field in the past and doesn't now. And so uh, they've had some uh, pretty strong failures even with their hand-waving Right, theory. right, okay. Uh, can I put you on the spot? Is there any predictions you could make based upon your starlight and time model? Uh, predictions that could be tested? Oh, um, yes, although the theory needs to really be developed further to make some good uh, predictions, and I have a list of 
things that, uh, at the end of my book, some things that, uh, if the theory is developed, it looks like certain things will happen. And one of those is evidence for um, the Earth and our galaxy being near a center. Uh, and there has turned up such evidence. Uh, oh, interesting. Yes, uh, that's uh, the quantized redshifts, uh, the fact that redshifts occur in bundles and bunches, and uh, they're not smoothly distributed. Uh, uh, so uh, those are proportional to distances, we think. And uh, so it sort of suggests that the galaxies are arranged around our own galaxy uh, in spherically concentric shells, statistically speaking. Uh, you know, no real hard shells out there, just uh, they tend to be at certain distances and not at others. That's evidence uh, that we are uh, near the center of that concentric arrangement, which is what one would expect uh, if the Bible's uh, account is correct of uh, the Earth being near the center. So uh, that's a very basic prediction. There's other evidence of that type. And then uh, my second cosmology uh, very nicely explains uh, the deceleration of the Pioneer space probes as they got out uh, far out beyond the edge of the solar system. Uh, they observed uh, over a space of 10 years that uh, the Pioneers were slowing down a little bit more uh, than anything they could explain it with. But that data fits in nicely uh, to my second cosmology, and I have an article in the in the Journal of Creation that was Volume 21, two, 2007. Uh, Creationist okay. cosmologies solve the pioneer anomaly. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. I know the viewers will really appreciate this, so I'll say a huge thank you for them, and as well for myself. I really appreciate that you took time out to have this time with us. Well, my pleasure to do so. Always a lot of fun. You can learn more about Dr. Humphrey's Starlight and Time model either through his book or an excellent DVD production, which is a layman's explanation of the book, both available through the Creation Research Society. This interview was edited for television, but you can catch the entire interview on our YouTube channel. Just head on over to genesisweek.com, which takes you to our YouTube channel. Stick around. We'll be back in just a minute.